Why are so many people switching away from traditional control links like Spectrum, FreeSky, and Futaba and switching to ExpressLRS? It's not really a big surprise. ExpressLRS offers amazing performance, tens of kilometers of range, sub two millisecond latency, and it's open source, so there's lots of different manufacturers, it's always in stock somewhere, and it's not even that expensive. Those are all some of the reasons why people are switching to ExpressLRS. But there's still some holdouts out there. Holdouts who say that ExpressLRS operating at 2.4 gigahertz frequency doesn't have the range and penetration that they want from a true long range system. They say that 900 megahertz is where to be. And they stick with, well, crossfires, mostly what they use, TBS crossfire. But ExpressLRS has always had the ability to operate in 900 megahertz. It just so happens that it's never been as popular as 2.4 gigahertz. But all that may be about to change today with the release of this hardware. These are all 900 megahertz ExpressLRS modules. And I think it's time we ask the question, is it time for 900 megahertz holdouts? to switch to Express LRS? Is it time for people who are running on 2.4 gigahertz to switch to 900 megahertz? I'm Joshua Bardwell. You're going to learn something today. The product that's inspired today's video are these, the RadioMaster Bandit modules. This is the micro, this is the nano, and this is the full-size RadioMaster Bandit module. And what makes them different from previous Express LRS modules that you've seen is that they operate in the 900 megahertz frequency band. Uh, but we're not just looking at the Radio Master Bandit modules here because there is another 900 megahertz module that has come out semi-recently that I've heard really, really good things about. This is the Emacs Eris 900 megahertz module, and it does something that these other three don't. I'll tell you what it is a little later in the video. I have to confess that this is actually not the 900 megahertz Eris module. I accidentally bought the 2.4 gigahertz one. They look identical, and if you decide to buy one, don't buy the wrong one by accident. Uh, but the things I'm going to say about it in this video are true. I just won't actually be able to do like an output power test. What all of these modules have in common is that they run in the 900 megahertz frequency band. And there are certain pros and cons to that that I think we should get out of the way before we look at the individual products. First of all, when I say 900 megahertz, there are some of you who are, well, in Europe specifically, and you're thinking, wait, we don't use the 915 megahertz frequency band. We use the 868 megahertz frequency band. Whenever we say 900 megahertz, we mean both 915 and 868. Depending on which part of the world you're in, you will use one of those, but not both. And uh, all 900 megahertz uh, equipment is capable of supporting both bands. The big advantage of the 900 megahertz band is that the frequency is lower and the wavelength is longer. And anybody who has had neighbors playing loud music late into the night understands the principle that lower frequencies propagate better. You hear the bass, you don't hear the treble. Lower frequencies propagate better. They pass through obstacles better. A lower frequency control link is going to have more range and penetration, all else being equal, than a higher frequency control link. The other thing that lower frequencies do better, and this is a little hard to explain, but there's a, a phenomena called refraction. No, diffraction. There's a phenomenon called diffraction, and what that means is that when the signal passes around an obstacle, it will kind of bend around the obstacle. So if you imagine the signal going over a hill in the terrain, a higher frequency signal is going to be shadowed by the terrain, whereas a lower frequency signal is going to be a little more able to bend around that obstacle and sort of shine its signal into the shadow. Neither 900 megahertz nor 2.4 gigahertz are particularly good at this. They're still too high frequency, but 900 megahertz is slightly better than 2.4 gigahertz. And that comes up, especially when you're doing things like mountain cruising, where you might be kind of semi-shadowed by a mountain peak or something like that. It's going to help you get just a little bit more coverage in that way. So 900 megahertz receivers have more range and penetration than 2.4 gigahertz receivers, all else being equal. But... How much more, really? And is all else really equal? Those are questions we're going to tackle a little later in the video. Right now, I want to address one of the main downsides of 900 megahertz equipment, the size of the antennas. 
Here we've got a 900 megahertz Moxon style antenna. Moxon is the, no, it's not a brand or anything like that. It is a name for a type of antenna design. Like this little antenna here, this is a dipole antenna. This is a Moxon antenna. And for comparison here is the 2.4 gigahertz equivalent. Which of those are you going to be happier to stuff into your backpack? Obviously, the 2.4 gigahertz one is smaller, and that's true for the sort of generic dipole style antennas as well. Here is a 2.4 gigahertz dipole, and here is a 900 megahertz dipole. And uh, that's not just like because the Express LRS devs hate 900 megahertz. 900 megahertz is a longer wavelength, lower frequency, longer wavelength, and the antenna has to be tuned to the wavelength of the signal it is trying to receive. So when you go to higher frequencies like 2.4 and 5.8 gigahertz, an equally well-performing antenna gets smaller. So there's a little bit of a trade-off there. Whether that matters to you, well, some people are going to look at this and go, that's not so bad. But that doesn't just apply to the radio that you have to put in your backpack. It also applies to the quadcopter. And I've got to be honest with you, this tiny little freaking 2.4 gigahertz antenna was secretly one of the top reasons that I switched away from TBS Crossfire as my sort of daily driver control link and over to Ghost at 2.4 gigahertz and then Express LRS at 2.4 gigahertz. And it seems like such a small thing, ha, <laughs> pun intended. Like, who cares, right? Who cares about this bigger antenna? It's not much difference in weight. And its mounting is basically the same. This bigger antenna is so much more likely to get chopped up. It's so much more likely to get chopped up. All my Crossfire antennas were getting chopped up all the time, and I kind of didn't care because you still got pretty good range and penetration. It is just so much easier to mount an Express LRS antenna, and you have so much more flexibility about where you mount it. Like, if you knew you were going to mount it in the back of the quad right here, then there's not that much difference between 900 megahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. But with 2.4 gigahertz, you can mount it on the arm, you can mount it vertically. It's really hard to mount one of these vertically because it freaking sticks up and down so far. You have a lot more flexibility. Those smaller antennas, they really do make your life easier. So you really got to want 900 megahertz. You really got to want what it brings to the table. What's the deal with this Moxon antenna anyway? And what's the difference between it and this smaller dipole? The Moxon antenna is a higher gain antenna. It's gonna give you more range and penetration, but it's also gonna be more directional. So the idea is this is sort of a low and medium range general purpose antenna that gives you omnidirectional coverage in roughly a sphere around yourself. It's got a little bit of a dead spot if it's if the end of the antenna is pointed directly at the quad, but it's not that pronounced. And as long as you're within even medium range, you know, tens of kilometers, you'll probably be fine. The Moxon antenna has a more directional pattern and it is not a patch antenna. If it were a patch antenna, we would point this part of it at the quad. It actually, you put it off your radio and you point it at the quad like this. Okay, and that it sort of shoots out the coverage. If you know that you'll be able to point the antenna at the quad through most of the flight, then you can choose this and you're gonna get about three dB of additional gain, maybe two or three dB, which as I don't know if I mentioned it, it's about 1.4 times the range compared to an Omni dipole antenna. Uh, this is included with the big boy module uh, and it is available for aftermarket purchase if you wanna use it with one of the other modules. There's one more limitation of Express LRS at 900 megahertz. And in order to demonstrate it to you, I'm gonna power up one of these modules and I don't even have to plug the module into a radio because all of these modules have a screen and a joystick built in. That's pretty cool. In the 2.4 gigahertz Ranger line, only the biggest, most expensive module had a screen and a joystick. And if you are used to using the Express LRS Lua script from your radio screen, that's fine. You can do everything you need to do. But having a joystick and screen on the back of the radio certainly is nice. Uh, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. We'll pick this one. doesn't matter. They all, they're all the same. Let's plug the module in and it will power up. And the first thing we're going to see it say is no handset. It knows that it's not plugged into a handset, but that's okay. We can just long press the menu and we can get all of the Express LRS options that we would normally access through the Express LRS Lua script via the tools menu in your controller. So normally you would use your controller screen and buttons to do that, but some people find that to be a little bit cumbersome. And so if you want to, you can access those options here 
And of course, it's also nice for demonstrating on the bench where I don't have to plug a radio in. But if I go to the packet rate option, you can see here that the fastest packet rate that the 900 megahertz module supports is 200 hertz. It supports all of the lower packet rates. And in fact, it goes all the way down to 25 hertz, whereas 2.4 gigahertz only goes down to 50 hertz. So that means 900 megahertz has the ability to access even longer range. The lower the packet rate, the longer range that you'll get. Um, that's another advantage for 900 megahertz that it goes down to 25. Um, but it only goes up to 200. And that means that the, the trade-off is you're not going to get the absolute lowest latency. So 2.4 gigahertz systems, uh, Express LRS systems can go up to 1000 hertz. And that gives you sub 2 millisecond latency. That's extraordinary. But you get reduction in range as you go to those higher data rates. I do want to point out that that 200 hertz that you're seeing here, it would be really tempting to compare that to TBS Crossfire at 150 hertz. That's the fastest packet rate that Crossfire supports. But there's a little technical detail in here that means you're not comparing apples to apples. TBS Crossfire only supports 150 hertz when it is using, is it FSK? I think it's FSK modulation. And FSK modulation is not the, it's an older uh, generation of modulation, similar to that spectrum radio that I chucked behind me at the beginning of this video. In other words, Crossfire at 150 hertz doesn't deliver on the ultra long range that these systems are actually selected for. If you fly Crossfire, you'll notice that at 150 hertz, as soon as you get a few hundred meters away from yourself, let's say, it drops down to 50 hertz, and then you're in the LoRa mode that makes the range and penetration of these systems so extraordinary. So uh, these ExpressLRS 900 megahertz systems are delivering something that previous 900 megahertz systems like Cross, well, Crossfire is, uh, let's just, you know, call it what it is, they didn't deliver. You can actually do 200 hertz with low raw or go all the way down to 25 hertz if you really want to stretch the range. There's one more disadvantage of 900 megahertz that I almost forgot to mention in this video because it's been so long since I switched to 2.4 gigahertz that I haven't thought about this in forever. And it has to do with racing and other high density environments. The 900 megahertz or 868 megahertz spectrum is not very wide. I think it's only about 15 megahertz wide if I remember correctly. And that means that you can only get so many radios, so many transmitters in that frequency band without causing interference between them. And I know we're used to thinking of control links, digital control links, as essentially immune from interference. And that's true in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum because it is so freaking wide. It's like 85 megahertz wide, I believe. But then in the 900 megahertz band, there's not a lot of space there and it gets crowded. And people who run Crossfire may remember races where all the racers were running crossfire. They were all kind of at max power and they all had temporometry and everybody was interfering and fail safing each other. And race directors had to go through all these procedures, like forcing everybody to reduce power, to turn off telemetry, to avoid interference. All of that stuff is mostly forgotten with 2.4 gigahertz. Racers running Express LRS or Immersion RC Ghost in the 2.4 gigahertz band basically just do whatever they want and there's no interference. If you decide to go back to 900 megahertz, that might be a bad decision for you if you are a racer or if you regularly fly in high density environments with a lot of other pilots in the air, more than like two or three. Well, you can't really think about the range of a system like this without knowing its output power. And all of the RadioMaster Ranger modules go up to one watt of output power. That means you're not really giving up anything by choosing the nano or the micro-sized module versus the big boy uh, module. It's worth pointing out that the big boy version of the 2.4 gigahertz module could be hacked to go up to two watts and double its output power. As far as I know, that's not true for the 900 megahertz version, although I have asked Radio Master, and I'll put a note on screen if I find out that that's not accurate. The uh, Eris module from Emacs actually does go up to two watts. Uh, so that means it is gonna have double the power, which equates to about 1.4 times the range, all else being equal, of the one watt modules. If you're interested in how I freaking developed that, how do I know it's 1.4 times? There's actually math behind it. And if you're the kind of nerd who wants to learn more about the math, I've got a link in the video description to the video about the weird math between range and output power. 
Well, if all three of these modules go to the same 1 watt output power, then what the frick is the difference between them? And the answer is that depends on what kind of radio you've got. So you're going to take a look at the back of your radio, and many of the radios will have this style of module bay. This is called a JR module, and that would take the micro version of the Bandit. It would plug in there, and you would use that. There are other radios out there that have what's called a light style module bay, and they would take this one, the nano module. And then what the heck is the deal with the big boy? Because the big boy comes with two adapters, one adapter for a JR style module bay and one adapter for a nano style module bay, and they actually plug in on the back and screw to the back and let you adapt it to use it with any radio. But why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just buy the module that fits the radio that you have. I'm a little confused because with the 2.4 gigahertz version, the Ranger module, this guy could go to two watts. It had additional heat dissipation, whereas the other ones couldn't. They were limited to one watt. So you would get a bigger module, you get more output power. But as far as I know, that's not the case for the 900 megahertz bandits. And so what do you get? Well, this guy has an LED. It, ha it clearly has a bigger fan, but Radio Master does a pretty good job of designing their modules to not overheat and to run at full power for an extended time. Uh, so I think the main advantage that this module has is that it can take an external input more easily, and that means it opens up some possibilities. So this module has an external port labeled Crossfire, and it can take an external crossfire input from this plug, which it actually ships with. And the idea is that uh, like a Futaba uh, 14 or maybe the 16 model Futaba and the higher end spectrum radios actually have the ability to output a crossfire signal for use with an external crossfire module. And in the past, that literally meant TBS crossfire and nothing else. But these modules will also support a crossfire input from those radios. And so this means that someone who had a higher end Futaba and Spectrum Radio could actually use Express LRS if they wanted to. I'll put a link in the video description below to the page talking about how to do that because there's details there that I'm not familiar with because I just don't have a ton of experience with those radios. But for someone with an Edge TX or Open TX radio, for someone with a radio capable of natively interfacing via a module bay, I don't think there's really a compelling reason I can see for buying this bigger, more expensive module. There's one more really freaking cool thing about the Radio Master Bandit modules that I don't think is actually true for the Emacs Eris, so we'll, we'll set that aside. These guys can be flashed with firmware and used as receivers. What the, what's the freaking point of that? When you have a long range system, it is sometimes important that the telemetry get back to you. So if you look at a typical I don't have one handy. If you look at it, here we go. If you look at a typical receiver, it is capable of receiving the powerful one watt signal from the module, but the receiver, the receiver also transmits. It transmits telemetry back to the radio. And that telemetry includes things like battery voltage and GPS coordinates, but usually the telemetry is not considered mission critical. So the telemetry transmitter is typically maybe 100 watts, at, 100 milliwatts at most, and that means the range of the telemetry transmission is less than the range of the control link. So if you take this aircraft and you fly it far away, somewhere, 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers, I don't know, at some point, you will still have perfectly good control, one watt, but you will lose telemetry. Uh, but for true long-range systems, telemetry is often actually mission critical. For example, if you think about uh, Mavlink telemetry that's used for ground control in RG Pilot and PX4, uh, you need that. You could be flying the quad with telemetry and nothing else. You might not even have a traditional controller. It might be fully autonomous and programmable. What can you do about that? Well, if you take one of these modules and flash it to become a receiver, there's actually solder points inside here. I'm not going to open them up and show it to you. I'll show you a stock photograph. There's solder points in here, and you solder it up as a receiver. And now what you have is a receiver with a one-watt telemetry output. 
you have a receiver. You take one of these and you make it a receiver. You take the other one and you make it a transmitter. And now you have a fully symmetrical link where the output power of both the receiver telemetry and the control link is identical, which means you're going to maintain that telemetry as long as possible. And I happen to know that the ExpressLRS devs are actually working on support for Mavlink telemetry over ExpressLRS. And that's where this is going. And if you don't know what that is, then you probably don't even care about this feature. But that's what you would use this for. Those 900 megahertz SICK radios that I bought to put on my Pixhawk build, those are about to become completely obsolete because ExpressLRS is just going to freaking do it. And that's pretty freaking exciting. The ExpressLRS devs are serious about long range. What, what, what am I talking about? If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'll put a link down below and uh, uh, to my uh, Pixhawk build, and you can see what the world is like over there. Next, we're going to get out the Immersion RC RF power meter, and we're going to check the output power of these modules. As we do that, please keep in mind that the RF power meter is a hobby-grade power meter that gives us rough measurements that shouldn't be compared to like lab grade measurements. And we shouldn't assume that just because there's a little bit of variation in the output power that like the output power rating is like dishonest or inaccurate. You would need more accurate equipment in order to really make that determination. But it can at least give us a sense of what's going on with the power. And we can see here that uh, with the output power set to 100 milliwatts, we're getting uh, 125 milliwatts of output power here. And uh, the fan on my power supply has just kicked in. Apologies for that, but that's going to keep happening. Uh, and the reason you're hearing the fan from my power supply is I also have this plugged in to external auxiliary power to try to see how much power it will pull. I want to let you know that at 100 milliwatts of output power, it is pulling one watt. But I don't care about that. I want to crank this all the way up to the max. So we will hold this down and we will go to TX power. And oh, there we go. Okay, I see what's going on. We'll change it to a thousand milliwatts. Press to confirm. There we go. And God dang, 1.03 watts right on the money. Well, that's pretty accurate. Good. And we are pulling now just under three watts or 0 0.3 amps at nine volts. And the reason that 0 0.3 amps at nine volts matters is because if you are not running from an external power source, then you are going to be pulling power from your radio's internal power supply. And some radios don't have the ability to supply enough current to do that. If that's the case, you could always just pull out, like on my battery, I have a spare XT30 connector that's designed to plug into a module like this and power it directly off the battery, bypassing the internal power supply circuitry of the radio. Uh, the Radio Master Boxer, I feel pretty confident that newer radios like the Radio Master Boxer or the TX16S are more than capable of providing up to the maximum output power. But if you're not comfortable with that, you can always run it right off the battery. So far in the video, we've covered the major pros and cons of 900 megahertz versus 2.4 gigahertz Express LRS. And you might be starting to form an opinion on which one is the right one for you. Longer range, maybe 900 megahertz. Still pretty good range, but lower latency, maybe 2.4 gigahertz. But there's one thing that we haven't tested that really plays into that decision. And that is how much more range do you really get off of 900 megahertz than 2.4 gigahertz? Like, is it a lot or is it just a little? And we're going to tackle that question just as soon as I tell you about my Patreon. Patreon is a website where you can subscribe to me for as little as $2 a month or more if you feel like I've earned it. Patrons get access to my Discord server where you can talk to people about FPV, troubleshoot problems. There's a buy, sell, trade forum. It's just a really, really great place for people in the world of FPV to hang out. And you only get access to it by joining my Patreon. But mostly what I hope you get out of joining my Patreon is just a good feeling that you've been watching my content, you've been enjoying my content, you've been learning and benefiting from my content, and you feel like it's time to give something back. And if today is that day, there's a link in the video description below. I'd love to have you as a patron. The minimum is $2. If you feel like giving more, it's totally up to you. Just pick a number, sign up. I'd love to have you as a supporter. And if today's not the day, hey, you gotta keep making the content. I hope you keep watching the content and maybe the day will come. Okay, so here's how we're going to test the comparable range of 900 megahertz versus 2.4 gigahertz. Stick with me because this is going to require some explanation. We're going to use the table test or bench test method that is described on the ExpressLRS website. And this is a basic way of seeing if your receiver is getting the amount of energy that it should be getting 
from the transmitter. This is not a perfect lab test. Like, uh, we're not in an anechoic chamber here. There's going to be a lot of bounces and reflections. This is just a very, very rough field test, but I think it should start to give us some insights because I ain't got an anechoic chamber. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to put the quadcopter over there at a fixed distance, about maybe a meter and a half, I guess. And it is set up on a cardboard box with the antenna sort of floating in the air. So the antenna is not like too close to objects in space, but it is mounted on a quad because, well, that's how it would be in real life. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this antenna and turn it so it is parallel with the other antenna. So, like, I don't know, that's just giving us the best possible number. And the number is... Hey there, it's Joshua from the future. Turns out that the 900 megahertz module only goes down to 100 milliwatts. So I ran the 2.4 gigahertz test also at 100 milliwatts. And the number that I get is minus 24. Minus 24 dBm. Now let's compare that to the 900 megahertz module. And with the radio very carefully positioned in exactly -ish the same spot with the antenna aligned, and we get a number of minus 17. Jesus Christ. 900 megahertz is so much better than I thought. Okay, okay. So the first thing to know is that at equal distance and equal output power, at least as equal as we can make them here in my office, because this isn't a, like a lab, the 900 megahertz signal is negative 18 to negative 24. That is 6 dB. That's very convenient for the math. So the 900 megahertz signal is coming in 6 dB stronger. And that's because of the lower wavelength. Everything else is equal except the wavelength. It's 6 dB stronger. Very conveniently, 6 dB stronger equates to a doubling of range. So all else being equal, 900 megahertz will give you at twice the range of 2.4 gigahertz. Oh, but there's more. We're not done yet. Because if we look here in the Express LRS Lewis script, we can see that at a packet rate of 50 hertz, the uh, receive sensitivity of the 900 megahertz si system is minus 120 dB. That's the weakest signal that it is capable of receiving before you lose the signal. Now, actually, that's not even true because LoRa is capable of receiving a signal when it's actually below the noise floor. But that's like the threshold we use when we think about the sensitivity of the signal. Minus 120 dB. What is that equivalent for 2.4 gigahertz. Looking at the 2.4 gigahertz radio, we can see it's minus 115 dB. In other words, 900 megahertz has an additional 5 dB. That's almost another doubling of range. So now we're at four times the range for 900 megahertz. Oh, but there's more because in 900 megahertz, we can go all the way down from 50 hertz. We can go down to 25 hertz. Because who cares about latency? We're doing long range. And if you're willing to go down to 25 hertz, that buys you another 3 dB, which is 1.4 times the range. Again, it's too many numbers. It's too many numbers. Let me sum it up for you. If you're running at 50 hertz and one watt of output power, you will get four times the range by going with 900 megahertz instead of 2.4 gigahertz. If you are willing to buy the Emacs Eris module and put two watts of power out instead of one watt, that buys you another 3 dB or another 1.4 times the range. And if you're willing to drop down from 50 hertz to 25 hertz, because you're doing long range and who cares about latency, latency's not that bad, then you get another 1.4 times the range. And if you're willing to do all of those things, 25 hertz, 900 megahertz, and two watts output power, you get eight times the range compared to the absolute best that ExpressLRS uh, 2.4 gigahertz would do. Although I guess we have to acknowledge that this one module can go to two watts and could strip away 3 dB of that gain. In other words, 900 megahertz is way, way freaking better if you care about range and not latency. Way freaking better. I didn't even realize it was that much better. I was gonna be like 2X. There are going to be people watching this video who are super annoyed that I didn't range test this. They're going to say, how could you test or review a long range system without flying long range? And my standard answer to that is that there is no way in the United States to fly long range with even a vague plausible deniability of legality. And I'm just not willing to get my channel slammed like Wesley Vardy did 
with his local authorities. I'm not willing. I mean, if they said it's a three thousand dollar fine and then that's it, I'd think about whether that money was worth spending. But it's about the hit that you take on your channel and the attention you get to yourself from the authorities. I feel like it would be a potentially career ending risk for me to do long range flying. So I'm not going to do it. I hope that I have given you good, solid information that you can use to make a call as to whether this is for you. Because here's the thing. It's so much longer than 2.4. Then you have to ask yourself, how much do I care about the larger antennas and how much do I care about the increase in latency? And then you just decide if this is the direction you want to go. And if you do decide this is the direction you want to go, there's links down below to these products where you can pick them up. And it sure means a lot when you use those links. Those are affiliate links. And that means that every time you use those links, it's like you saying, hey, Bardwell sent me. And then the vendor, the store, gives me a little bit of a kickback on whatever it is you purchase. So anytime you go shopping, easy way to support the channel is just click those affiliate links down below my videos. You can even bookmark them. I don't care. They don't care. Click that affiliate link. Go do your shopping. Check out. I get a little commission. There's actually a little bit more going on with this big boy module than I got into in this video. It's got a couple of features that I didn't think would be deal breaker features for most people, so I didn't dive into them. But I want to refer you to my original review of the 2.4 gigahertz Ranger module, which goes into some of those features. It's got like a tilt sensor where when you set your radio down on the table, it shuts the radio to low power so you don't waste your battery power. I'm going to put a card on screen uh, to that as well. I'm going to put a card on screen to uh, my uh, Express LRS binding tutorial and setup tutorial. It's actually part of my local, my build series where I built a quadcopter and I did it with an Express LRS receiver. And if you're just getting into Express LRS, even if you're not building that exact quad, that may give you information you need to kind of get started working with Express LRS. I'll see you there.